Welcome to the HR Empowerment Podcast, where we will uncover strategies and new insights from HR professionals who discuss up-to-date regulations, best practices, and the most pressing topics like diversity and equity, leadership, dealing with difficult situations, and much more that affect your bottom line and business. Thanks for joining us. Hey everybody, welcome back. Wendy Sellers here, the HR lady with JC. Hey, we are, hey, We're going to continue our conversation on unique, weird, and even wacky employment laws across the United States. Uh, definitely want to talk about some things that changed during the pandemic, as if we in HR haven't had enough on our plate. So many states went and changed laws or created new laws that you may be hearing about for the first time today. Yeah, there's so much going on in the world of laws, right? You know, in 2021, state and municipal legislators uh, shift their focus away from COVID-19 regulations towards more traditional employment law issues. And as time went by, although COVID-19 related legislation has gone into effect in multiple states and the District of Columbia, specifically in 2022, the rest of the country is seeing a much more diverse set of employment laws going into effect throughout the span of the year. California. Illinois, New York, Oregon, they were all extremely active. These states and the District of Columbia have enacted family leave legislation, with California adding protected leave for the care of in-laws for both private and public sector employees. The COVID-19 epidemic undoubtedly had an impact on everything that we're talking about right here. Wendy, over to you. Yeah, I love the one about the care of, of parents, uh, parent in-laws, you know, for private and public sector employers, of course, with California, like you just said. And, and what I see um, often is California or another another employee focused state will do something and then, you know, slowly but surely other other um, states will add it into their into their you know laws as well. Now, here's the thing, everyone that's listening, if you are um managing employees that are sprinkled throughout the united states you know a state here a couple states there you don't have to wait for a law to come out you can say you know what we are we have you know an office in california or maybe up in massachusetts uh and we are gonna as a company follow the most strict laws even though they're not laws in all of our states you can do that that's that's kind of wild talk to me about that your employment attorney is going to go, don't listen to her. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but listen, listen to me for a second. Just hear me out. The reason I would suggest this is, is a couple of reasons. One, it would be easier to just have one set of policies, right? So you don't have to have a handbook and say, okay, these last few pages of the handbook, this addendum is for California. This addendum is for Pennsylvania. This addendum is for Florida. What I inevitably see happen, because I've lived it, is the people in the other states that are not protected then find out that, hey, uh, in Oregon recently, they added an anti-discrimination statute to include natural hairstyles as a protected characteristic. So of above and beyond the EEOC characteristics, Oregon is a state said if you have a company, you have a company in our state, you cannot discriminate against natural hairstyles. This was specifically for you know, African American, black, um, non-white people. Let's face it. Let's put it that way, so that employers can't say, "Oh, no dreads. You have to shave your hair. You have to do this. You have to do that." Oregon said, "Nope, we're not going to play that game." Now, you, as a company, can say, "Neither are we. All of our our uh, states, all of our orga- all of our locations are going to adopt this." The only risk I would say there is. Um, Again, I'm not an HR, I'm not an employment lawyer. Uh, I have a lot of experience, but I would suggest that you do get with your employment lawyer because the only risk I say there is if you are going to follow something that's not law and then you screw up because you didn't train your managers, you're going to be held accountable by, by, you know, law because it's in your policy book. Does that make sense? Absolutely does. And you know, the same strategy was used in a few towns in North Carolina in keeping with the growing theories of how to effectively separate independent contractors from employees, states have introduced legislation that harshly penalizes firms that mistakenly classify their personnel as independent contractors. So aside from natural hairstyles, moving down a separate path, 
There's a whole lot of stuff going on there when we think about California, AB5. And going back to what Wendy said, if you take some of the strictest policies out there and consider enacting that within your organization, this is uh, this is one of those moments we might leave a light on for you, you know? <laughs> leave a light on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's going to be have a big giant help sign on it, right? Exactly. Hey, I've got one out of left field I want to hit you with here, though. Um, new, ele- this is, this is fairly new in 2022 in New York state, believe it or not, Wendy, new electronic monitoring notice requirements. It's a law that compels New York state companies to notify new hires when they monitor or otherwise intercept phone calls, emails, or internet usage or access using any electronic device or system. The law took effect May 7, 2022 in New York. Employees must acknowledge receipt of the notification in writing or electronically, and the notice must be in written or electronically communicated forms. Additionally, employers must display a notice about electronic monitoring where it can be seen by the workers who are being monitored electronically. Kind of thought you might find that interesting in regards to COVID-19 and remote work and everything that we're up against. And geez, employers, they've got employees all over the country, like you had mentioned, right? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. I mean, I I could see why it's necessary to say, hey, you weren't uh, you weren't maybe remote before, and now you are temporarily or permanently. By the way, these are all the things we're going to monitor off of your computer or email, whatever. Uh, I, I you know that I see both sides of that, like a little bit of an invasion of privacy. But in my opinion. If the employer provided all those resources, like the computer, the internet, um, email, then that's they have the right to do that. But yikes! How about man? Talk about no trust. <laughs> ha- having the right to it to do it, and, and now the employees, all they got to do is let the employees know that they are doing it. it, it you know, it does change the paradigm of the workforce here a little bit. Hey, three states though. Three states uh, improve the enforcement of non compete agreements. Non-compete agreements of more than 12 months will no longer be enforceable in Oregon, or it might be Oregon, depending on where you're from, as of January 1st, 2022. Non-compete, it's such a big issue in 2022. What's with that? Well, I think it goes back to a couple of our other podcasts that um, we have coming out or have come out is, you know, the lack of staffing, um, you know, trying to hold on to talent. We're spending tons of money. To and time and time is money to get talent, and now we want to hang on to them, and so that's probably where some of the non compete is coming to to saying, hey, no, you can't go work for a competitor after we just trained you um, with all this information, um, and you know, spent all this money to train and develop you and, and get you up to speed, and now you're going to take that information somewhere. But you know, that I think that's you know, the non compete and the non disclosure are two different things. So. Don't you can leave here. You just can't take our stuff with you and share it with other with other companies. I'm cool with that. And I think most employees would be like, yeah, no problem. I'm not going to steal your information. Wink, wink, because we know some employees <laughs> will. But generally speaking, <laughs> but the non-compete, man, it always it always bugs me. Like, if are you that concerned as an employer that people are going to leave you? And if you are, what do do something different. Change your change your environment. <laughs> so we've got two more things here before I want to get into workplace postings with you, if that's okay. You know, OSHA, yeah. OSHA issued a emergency temporary standard at the end of the year requiring firms with 100 or more employees to verify that every employee is COVID-19 immunized or alternatively submit to weekly COVID-19 testing. We've seen a lot of things back and forth with that throughout the country. What are your thoughts on Oh my goodness. I have done so much training on that. Like every week during that time period, there was something new, uh, more, even if OSHA didn't issue, issue something new, it was one of those, okay, something's coming up that they're clarifying this. And then there's lawsuits and there's this and there's that. So, you know, my, my thoughts are without taking either side is like, they're trying to do the best that they can to, to get, keep our, uh, country as a whole safe, get people to, you know, try to protect the the folks that needed it the most, whether you believe in vaccines or not, I, I, you know, it's irrelevant at this point in time. 
um, because we a lot of people did go and get vaccinated. My biggest concern, and at that point in time, I was living in an area where there was a lot of elderly people. Yeah. I mean, it was all el- all elderly people and me, I felt. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I also have a few clients that were assisted living facilities. And, and, you know, we did see deaths, unfortunately. And, you know, when it came into in, in the healthcare um, industry, I agreed with it because, you know, you as an employer, you, your, your clients are sick people and elderly or not. And so you should not only want to protect the clients, the customers, the patients, but also your employees. So the healthcare one, I think most people kind of were like, okay, I get that the non-healthcare one, and it was a borderline violation of rights. Um, so, and for me, I had to do training on it all the time. So it it was hard. It was hard. Um, I, I just try to do with the, like, you know, deal with the, listen, we're here. Nobody, um, you know, most of us in the workforce have not dealt with something like this before a pandemic, although we have another one coming monkeypox, um, is, is here as well. And that might be affecting our workforce. So I'm, I'm just glad I didn't work at OSHA at that point in time, but I have to tell you, JC last year, the year before, I have never used the word OSHA and been on the OSHA website more in my life. (laughs) (laughs) And I hope I never have to again, because I never wanted to be the safety person or the OSHA expert. Um, So for now, I don't believe there's any vaccine requirements um, per OSHA. I think they all got thrown out, but some organizations still might have some, depending on what state you're in. In the state of Florida, you pretty much kind of can't have one. And I say it pretty much because the way the governor rolled out the rules, when you've looked through it, you kind of can't have one. You have to have exceptions for everything. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hey, let's let's pivot away from COVID-19 and and sickness here for a brief moment. I'm going to bring you back up to New York because New York State human rights law anti-retaliatory practice protection went into effect on March 16, 2022. And this statute became... Uh, immediately operative that day. Look, according to the law, it's against the law for an employer to reveal a worker's personnel records because the worker objected to a practice that was prohibited by the New York State Human Rights Law Anti-Retaliatory Commission, right? So because the worker had lodged a complaint, provided testimony, or offered assistance in a case underneath these provisions or in any other judicial or administrative proceeding, you, you can't take retaliatory functions on them. When launching or responding to a complaint in a legal or administrative procedure, the law does allow employers to reveal personnel files at the right time when commencing uh, respondents to judicial or administrative proceedings. But you just can't go releasing employee files uh, willy-nilly anymore here in New York, especially if yeah. it's in this protected situation. Well, it makes sense. I mean, uh, they they should be protected. They're going to court. Um, they're either told to go to court. They're going for an action. You shouldn't shouldn't be able to throw them under the bus. Then the, here's the other interesting thing about personnel files for folks that are listening. Know your state laws on this too, because some states require that and if an employee asks for a copy of their personnel file, you have to give it to them. Now you don't have to give it to them right then and there but you may have to give it to them within 24 to 48 hours. Um, In other states, they know you don't have to do that. It's up to the employer to to say. Yeah, Yeah. that's a a big broad brushstroke between two different perspectives there. What what is it down in Florida? What do you think it is? You you just give it away. You (laughs) give it away. Highest bidder. I'll meet you at the flea market. I want to suggest that, but in in Florida, you don't have to. Um, give, you know, the employee now a lawyer asked you for it, a court asked for it. Of course you have to, that's, you know, that's a legal requirement, but you do need to know, um, because I have revised quite a few handbooks that, um, I'll look at the handbook and, and it'll say in there, yes, we'll give you your records. Um, you just need to give us 24 hours notice. And, and I say, well, that's, that's cool. I think that's great. Transparency to me is, is key. But let's make sure we clean up those records first, because you may be putting things in files or have managers that have access to things that they shouldn't. So let's clean up all the records first and then say, yes, employee, come on in, see what do we have? That's no problem. But 
just know by law, you may be required to do that and you may not be required. And if you're required to do that by law and you have things in the wrong folders or things that are not factual, you may get yourself in trouble. Nobody wants to be in trouble. And speaking about people in trouble, anyone listening today, you know you are definitely not in trouble. You are in our good graces and we love having you here. Isn't that right, Wendy? Absolutely. And in fact, we're going to wrap up this session and come back in episode three and talk a little bit about Ban the Box movement. See you shortly. Take care. Thank you for joining the HR Empowerment Podcast brought to you by Aurora Training Advantage. We hope you've gained new insight and strategies to navigate the HR profession. We look forward to you joining us again on the HR Empowerment Podcast.